Well, please, congregation, turn within your Bibles this evening to 1 Peter chapter 5. 1 Peter chapter 5, we'll look at the first seven verses together as God's divine instruction for life in his church, divine instruction not only for shepherds, but also for his sheep. We read these verses written by the Apostle Peter. And we know about the Apostle Peter, that although he himself had once denied the Good Shepherd, the Good Shepherd being so gracious and kind, yet restored Peter and recommissioned Peter to the office of under-shepherd to tend to his sheep. I wonder if the Spirit of Christ had impressed those words on his heart and mind when, when Peter put pen to paper, when wrote these words. If we consider... Tonight, in connection with the installation of new office bearers here at Adoration, 1 Peter chapter 5, being at verse 1, this is God's holy word. So I exhort the elders among you as a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, as well as a partaker in the glory that is going to be revealed. Shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly, as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly, not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him, because he cares for you. This is God's holy word. May he bless it to us as we meditate upon it this evening. Dear congregation of the Lord Jesus Christ, according to the scriptures, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have all turned aside, every one of us, to our own way. And yet the Lord has laid on him, the Lord Jesus Christ, the iniquity of us all. Those are the familiar words of Isaiah 53. And in 1 Peter chapter 2, the apostle Peter drew upon the imagery of that prophecy when, when he called his readers to recognize that it is in fact a gracious thing in the sight of God. When mindful of God, we endure sorrows while suffering unjustly. For to this said Peter we have been called because Christ also suffered for us, leaving us an example that we might follow in his steps. For Christ committed no sin, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten. But he continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds, said Peter, we have been healed. For you were straying like sheep, said the apostle. But now you have returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Peter has been very concerned to remind his readers that when it comes to our suffering, we stand in solidarity with our Savior. We stand in solidarity with our Savior who suffered also by humbling himself, not only in his life, but also in his death, even to the point of of dying that death on the cross. Jesus did that for the fold, for the flock of God, in order that we might yet teach our children to, to learn, to sing those cherished words of Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so as I meditate on this passage, particularly with regards to its personal application, not only for me, but also for our new office bearers who have just been installed, I was gripped again by the wonder of what Jesus came to do for his people. How, as the good shepherd, Jesus entered into the mass that his sheep had made of their lives, and seeing the full extent of their need, he had compassion on them. He had compassion on them because he saw that they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Beloved sheep need a shepherd. Without a shepherd, sheep are without hope in a hostile world. Without a shepherd, sheep cannot survive on their own because when the wolf comes, their vulnerability necessarily leads to their destruction. 
And for that reason, God sent Christ into the world to provide for his, shaving, for his straying sheep, a faithful shepherd, a shepherd who, who knows us, a shepherd who feeds us, a shepherd who, who leads us and protects us. Because sadly, throughout the ages, God's people found themselves lacking that very thing. Time and again, they, they found themselves without faithful shepherds to tend their needs, without faithful shepherds to, to watch over them as God called them to do. The Lord lamented that very thing in Jeremiah 50 when he said, My people have been lost sheep. Their shepherds have led them astray, turning them away on the mountains. From mountain to hill they have gone. They have forgotten their fault. In Ezekiel 34, God prophesied against the shepherds of Israel who, who rather than feeding the sheep had begun to feed only themselves. And so the sheep of God were scattered. They became food for the wild beasts. And yet we know that God had made a promise in the days of Jeremiah chapter 3 when he said to the people of Israel that a day would come when he would give them loving shepherds after his own heart who would, who would feed them with knowledge and understanding. And then in the fullness of time, boys and girls, God fulfilled that promise in the sending of his son who, who came to say, I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. I have come that they might have life and have it abundantly. I have come to assure them that no one can snatch them out of my hand, for no one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. Jesus, of course, is the good shepherd. But as the good shepherd, he has not left his flock to be orphans in the world, but he has entrusted his pastoral, his shepherding ministry to pastors and elders and deacons so that the sheep might be protected and provided for until the last day when the psalmist's words shall finally come true and they shall finally dwell in the house of the Lord forever. That's what Peter, by the Spirit of Christ, is endeavoring to show us here in our text for this evening. Sheep need shepherds in order to survive. And so the good shepherd has provided under shepherds for our survival so that they too, in the name of Christ, might enter into the mess that we oftentimes make of our lives, that they might restore us again to the fold, that they might lead us again along the green pastures, again along those still waters and the paths of righteousness. But in order for this shepherd ministering to work well, in order for God to be so glorified by this ministry, then we must all forfeit every ounce of pride that rests in our hearts and trade it in for Christ-like humility. The shepherds and the sheep alike must clothe themselves in the garments of Christ's humility, for God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. In a world where pride reigns supreme, Christ-like humility ought to reign in the church. In a world of selfish ambition, where, where men and women seek to climb their way to the top of the ladder, stepping on whatever heads they need to, to step on to get to the top, the church of Christ is to be others-oriented. In submission to Christ, for God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Peter wants us to see that in light of three things this evening. First of all, in the selfless calling of Christ's shepherds. Secondly, in the submissive clothing of Christ's sheep. And finally, in the sure comfort of Christ's sovereignty. In the last two chapters of his epistle, the apostle has been camping out in the realm of suffering, acknowledging that Christians suffer a great deal in this life. Christians suffer under unjust rulers and cruel masters. In fact, there are very likely some men and women sitting in the pew as Peter writes to them who have stripes on their backs because their masters are that cruel. Peter acknowledges that there are Christians suffering in relationships and in homes where there are, are godly wives who love Christ living with husbands who don't love Christ, where there are godly husbands living with wives who don't love Christ. And so you can about imagine the sense in which many of these Men and women live a life of constant walking on eggshells in the home on account of their faith in Christ. Peter acknowledges how often Christians suffer in the world, even for righteousness' sake. And yet Peter says in verse 13 of chapter 4, to rejoice insofar as you share in Christ's sufferings, that you also may rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. For if you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed because the spirit of God and of glory rests upon you. This is the makeup of the congregations to whom the Apostle Peter is writing. They are people living with much suffering, 
the people living in the midst of much ridicule and pain. And it's in light of that reality that the Apostle Peter now writes these words to the elders. He makes an appeal to them as a fellow elder, as a witness of Christ's sufferings, as a partaker of the glory that is to be revealed. You see, the Apostle Peter, having been commissioned by Christ himself to tend his sheep and to feed his lambs, is very concerned to show his readers that he shares their burdens, that he is a fellow elder, that their suffering is his suffering, that their struggles are, are his struggles. When he says that he also is a witness of the sufferings of Christ, Peter is highlighting that which needs to be at the very heart of pastoral shepherding ministry. Peter has learn shepherding from the good shepherd himself. And what he learned from the good shepherd is that selflessness must now be emulated by the under shepherds. That the under shepherds must emulate the self-sacrificing selflessness of, of the good shepherd to those in their flock. They are to lead according to Christ's example. And as Jesus led with grace, so too the shepherds are to lead with grace. When Christ looked upon his sheep, he selflessly entered into their brokenness that he might bear their baggage on his own shoulders. Even as he hung on the cross, that's what he was doing for the apostle Peter. As Christ was dying, Peter was denying. But Christ was the good shepherd bearing up even that brokenness, that baggage on his own shoulders as he hangs on the cross. And so now it's being aware of his own failures and shortcomings in the past. Peter now exercises a form of divinely inspired mutual censure in order to instruct and admonish the elders of the church to be the shepherds that Christ has called them to be. And so he says, shepherd the flock of God that is among you, exercising oversight, not under compulsion, but willingly as God would have you, not for shameful gain, but eagerly not domineering over those in your charge, but being examples to the flock. My fellow elders, does your shepherding look and sound like this? Do you know the sheep whom God has entrusted to your care? Do you know them well enough to, to minister to their personal needs? Is it your aim to ensure that the sheep of your district see in your care for them that you love them in a way that is similar to the way that Christ loves them, selflessly and sacrificially? Because that's what your office is to be all about, to rule in the name of our ascended king and to care for the flock. For Christ came to serve as the good shepherd, not under compulsion, but willingly, not for selfish gain, but just the opposite, with eagerness and joy to obey his Father in heaven, recognizing that, that doing so would cost him greatly. And he wasn't domineering either. Christ didn't come as, as a wild cowboy to drive the cattle forward, but he came as a shepherd to, to walk before and to walk alongside of. God calls you brothers to engage in this work. He calls you newly ordained men to engage in this work, even when it becomes hard and really difficult, when you're met with the various obstacles and oppositions. He calls you to engage in this work faithfully and fruitfully, to take seriously the vows that you've made. But Christ calls you to do that, to engage in that work with a promise, doesn't he, in verse 4? He says, shepherd in these ways so that when Christ, the chief shepherd, appears, you will receive the unfading crown of glory. Christ anchors his command and the promise as he always does. Shepherd this way. And you can be sure that when the chief shepherd appears, you too will receive the unfading crown of glory. Martin Luther once described the work of the pastor and elder this way, saying our office is a ministry of grace and salvation. It subjects us to great burdens and labors, dangers and temptations, with little reward or gratitude from the world. But Christ himself will be our reward if we labor faithfully. Likewise, John Calvin recognized that elders have often to do with ungrateful men from whom they receive an unworthy reward. 
And so to prevent the faithful servants of Christ from being cast down, there is one and one only remedy, says Calvin, that they should turn their eyes to the coming of Christ. For when he appears, they will receive the unfading crown of glory. In other words, godly elders are to exercise humility, trust, and even as God exalted the good shepherd who humbled himself, so too God will exalt his under-shepherds who humble themselves. And that much is true not only for the elders and deacons and ministers, but that much is true also for all of us. And so Peter says in verse 5, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. And he anchors the command and the promise, for God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Peter now shifts gears away from the narrow body of elders to the broader body of believers. And what Peter is saying is pretty clear. As elders are called to submit themselves to Christ, we as members are called to submit ourselves to our elders. Likewise, you who are younger, submit to the elders. This is what Peter says to us this evening by the Spirit of Christ. He specifically calls out those who are younger not to, not to exclude the rest of the congregation, not to give those who are older a free pass, but rather Peter speaks especially to those who are younger because generally speaking it's those who are younger who more often need to be reminded that they are to live in submission to those whom God has placed in authority over them. And so you might ask the question, where does this submission begin in the life of the congregation? And we recognize that this submission to elders begins in the first place by acknowledging our hearts that their authority doesn't come from themselves, but by acknowledging that their authority comes from Christ, the good shepherd himself. That when they minister to us, when they exercise discipline over us, they do so with the commissioned authority of King Jesus himself. They come in his name. They are his servants, his ambassadors. And they bear his authority. And so we confess in Article 31 of the Belgic Confession that those who have been chosen by the Lord are to be held in special esteem, especially for the work that they do, and that we are to be at peace with them without grumbling, quarreling, or fighting. Being patient with their failings, says Lord's Day 39, since through them God has chosen to rule over us. In God's wisdom, congregation, he has entrusted the care of his flock to shepherds. And so if we're to function well as a body of believers, if we're to survive the hostility of the world around us, we must surround ourselves with Christ-like humility on every side. We must surround ourselves with Christ-like humility even as our clothes cover our whole bodies. For the saying is trustworthy, people of God. It was trustworthy. King Solomon wrote it in Proverbs 3, and it's trustworthy today. God opposes the proud. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Can you say tonight, people of God, that you have clothed yourselves with humility? Again, John Calvin gets to the heart of this exhortation when he says, nothing is more contrary to the disposition of man than humble submission because every man has within himself the soul of a king. And that's true, isn't it? We all like to be the kings and queens of our own little castles. We all have the soul of a king. But the Spirit of Christ calls tonight to relinquish the rags of human pride for the robes of Christ-like humility. Peter uses the imagery of clothing because clothing is what people see. We often take notice of what people are wearing because what we wear often says something about who we are and what we're doing. The mic I'm wearing says something about who I am and what I'm doing. What we wear often says something about who we are. Or take, for example, the, the athletes on a sports team who all wear the same jersey to make clear not only to themselves but also to those who are watching that these ones are on the same team. And perhaps that's a, a helpful way to think about what Peter's describing here. We all need to be wearing the same thing, a jersey of humility toward one another so as so that we reflect Christ both to each other and also to the world around us. Clothe your sounds with humility toward one another. 
For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. This congregation is the resounding message of the kingdom of God. This is the Beatitudes in a nutshell, simultaneously comforting on the one hand and convicting on the other. God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Beloved, some of you who are here tonight need to be comforted in your hearts by these words. God gives grace to the humble. Because perhaps some of you have been humbled and have been brought very low in this life through trials and sufferings of various kinds. And you need to be comforted in your hearts that, that God's grace is for you this evening. God gives grace to the humble. We see that in the Gospels time and time again as those who, who come to Christ confessing their brokenness and their baggage receive the grace of Christ. There was... For example, that sick woman who humbly acknowledging her helplessness thought, if only I can touch his garment, then I will be healed. And then what happened? She was healed. There were those who were oppressed by demons who knew that only Christ could provide the help that they needed, and they too received the grace of Christ and found in Christ the relief their troubled spirits had been longing for. And perhaps some of you can relate to these broken people this evening because some of you have, have been humbled by great sorrows only to find on the other side that Christ was the one who, who brought you through it all. That in the midst of your being humbled, God was, was being gracious. He was teaching you to, to cast all your cares upon him that you might know for sure that he cares for you. And so you can take comfort in these words that God gives grace to the humble. There are likely also some of you who are here tonight who need to be convicted by these words. Some of you need to hear the words again, God opposes the proud. Perhaps the Spirit of Christ is prodding your heart even now to, to repent, to say in the quiet of your heart, Lord, I've been proud. I've been relying on myself, Lord. I've, I've been proud. I have not been clothing myself with humility. I've not been humble with those whom you've placed in authority over me. Perhaps some of you need to be caught by the heart that God opposes the proud. He opposes the pride in our hearts tonight. We need to confess that pride and forfeit that pride. All the while trusting in the promise that God gives grace to the humble. Trusting that God will continue to be gracious in the midst of our mess. That he will exalt us at the proper time provided that we humble ourselves under his mighty hand, casting all our cares upon him, recognizing that he cares for us. That's how Peter concludes in verses 6 and 7, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your cares on him, because he cares for you. What comfort belongs to the flock of God, to rest in the sovereignty of Christ, who, who says to us by his word and spirit, cast all your cares on me because I care for you. Christ is the great caretaker of humble care casters. Do you believe that tonight? That if you humble yourselves under his mighty hand, God will surely exalt you at the proper time. Again, John Calvin puts it so well when he says by these words, we are to imagine that God has two hands. One is like a hammer with which he, he beats down and, and breaks into pieces all those who proudly raise up themselves. But the other hand, which is like a prop that raises up the humble that have willingly bowed themselves down. Time and again, throughout the scriptures, God describes his hand, how his hand exalts the righteous, how how all we have needed, his hand has provided. Beloved, do you trust these words tonight? That God gives grace to the humble, that he is the great caretaker. That if you cast your cares on him, you can be sure that he'll bear them up because he cares for you. We might say that, but are we actually living that? seems that some of us cast off a lot of our cares on Facebook in the way of posts and shares and reshares. And perhaps we take some comfort in the likes those posts get in the, 
and the affirming comments those posts receive. Because there's some solace, isn't there, in knowing that we're not alone in all this, that you're not alone in your thoughts about COVID or politics, the ongoing restrictions and everything else, and I get that. But are you casting those cares every bit as much upon the Lord? Are you really doing that? Are you truly entrusting yourselves to the Father's care, to his care over creation, to his sovereign care over our rulers, to his sovereign care over you? Certainly I don't have all the answers to living life in a COVID world with restrictions and regulations. More than we can count, but I can tell you this much, it's not half as bad. It's not half as bad as the world that Peter's readers were living in here, which makes his instruction here every bit as relevant for us today as it was for them. When he says, humble yourselves, therefore under God's mighty hand that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. For he is the good shepherd, the chief overseer of our souls. It's quite profound, isn't it, that the most famous psalm of David, Psalm 23, comes to us in the heels of of Psalm 22, where David was, was crying out to God, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? David knew what it was to be plagued by cares and anxieties of living life in a fallen, sin tattered world. But having cast those cares upon the Lord, he transitions in Psalm 22 from, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? To to confess later on that Psalm, God has not despised, he has not abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. God has heard the prayer of his servant. And David, of course, can only pray that way in the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who would suffer as the afflicted one all by himself as he hangs upon the cross. And then David goes on to write Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Surely goodness and mercy shall pursue me all the days of my life and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. David, you see, finds great solace in the recognition that in in the midst of a hostile world where he is but a sheep before wolves, the sovereign Lord of the universe is his personal shepherd. And Peter knows that too. He knows that's true of us also, and that's why he says, humble yourselves. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God, so at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your cares upon him, because he cares for you. This is our Christian comfort. This is our comfort as Christ's under-shepherds. This is our comfort as Christ's sheep. God cares for us. That he is the God who says to an anxious, worrisome people in Luke chapter 12, therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about anything. Fear not, little flock, he says. It is your father's good pleasure to, to give you the kingdom. That's essentially what Peter's telling us here tonight. In the midst of enduring the sorrows, of suffering unjustly, in the midst of the mess we often make of our lives, Pastor Peter says, cast your cares upon the Lord because he cares for you. Amen. Let us pray. Gracious God and Heavenly Father, we come before you again and we're thankful for the great grace you've shown to the church of Jesus Christ by giving to her faithful men to serve as elders and deacons and pastors. We pray that you would grant our under-shepherds grace to live these words, O Father, to shepherd the flock of God that is among them, to do so willingly and gladly, to do so selflessly, not domineering but being patient as Christ has been patient with us. And in the same way, Lord, we pray that you grant us as a congregation humility. Humility in our engagements with these shepherds. Humility in our interactions with these shepherds. Humble hearts that honor them for their work's sake. Lord, we confess that each one of us has a king and a queen in his own soul. Each one of us so desires to be the king and queen of our own castle. 
Father, grant us to wear Christ-like humility, to clothe ourselves that humility. That to a watching world, that would be known by for our humility that is like the humility of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we pray that you would oppose the proud, that you would oppose the pride in our own hearts, that you would oppose the proud in this world. For there are many, Lord, who boast of great things, who know not the Lord. There are many who are so proud. We pray that you would oppose them, that you would bring the proud forces of Satan to nothing. We pray that you not only oppose them, that you would press them with the promise that you will give grace to the humble. Lord, help us to live those words, to live in light of that promise. That you give grace to the humble, to those who are lowly, to those who are brought low in this world, to those who choose to live lowly lives. Impress that promise in our hearts that you will give us grace if we live that way. Lord, we thank you that you hear us when we pray, that your shoulders are strong. In order that we might cast all our cares upon you, knowing that you care for us. Grant, dear Father, that we should humble ourselves under your mighty hand, that we should trust that a day is coming when you shall exalt us, when the world who ridiculed us shall see that we were those who belong to Christ, when each one of us shall receive the crown of glory. May we live these words also, dear Father, that we would cast our cares upon you, that we would spend much time in prayer, much time in casting our cares upon the God who hears. We pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen.